Okay. Hello, epidemics. So, what do you think? Which door would you choose? Three. <clears throat> you want to explain why? Well, a little Google search told me that lions can't survive without food <laughs> for more than a month. So, <laughs> probably decomposing as we speak. <laughs> well, that is the correct answer, but uh, Google searching, that's kind of cheating. <laughs> Fifth, uh, common sense led me there, but also wouldn't you, wouldn't the gas seep through that wooden door for door two? Well, yes, but I just put pictures of doors up to illustrate it. You don't I'll know that it's they're all solid metal, airtight, sealed. Megan, you got your hand up. I wanted to preface by saying I didn't Google search, but <laughs> I um I figured the lion, but humans can last without food for like months, right? I mean, under the right circumstances, like, you know, if they just have water. Um, so I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, I'm like, would the lion be alive? So that's interesting that it only takes a month for them. Yeah, they can survive long periods without food, but three months is too long. I think humans can survive like three weeks, maybe four. Uh, but I know water is like, water is essential. Like, yep. I think that's no more than four days max. Yep. Yeah, I've always heard three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. But four, yeah, same kind of time frame there. Maybe if you had like, if you had some like good weight on you, it'd probably take longer for like your yeah. body to eat itself. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely depends on how lean you are, which is why once you get over the age of 70, um, you're more likely to survive a hospitalization if you're carrying a little extra weight. Okay. Good. All right. New sign announcements. Same as last time. There's a quiz and a journal entry due before midnight on Sunday. Yeah, nice comment, Juliana. Um, I did mess up and put the journal entry in as a test instead of an assignment. I'll fix that in the grade book. Um, somebody caught that, but it's the same thing. And we've got a couple of weeks before we start. We have to... Um, decide on topics and formats for our project for this class. So I've created a content area or module that has all of the information on projects, as well as a place for you to sign up. If you sign up, you put in what you want to do, and you get a grade, because it's a graded thing, it doesn't really count, but if you get a grade of two, that means everything's approved, go right ahead. If you get a grade of one, that means there's something I want you to know about, go look at the comments. It may be, most commonly, it's you need to narrow the focus, but it might also be, hey, that's a great topic, I have a great resource for you. So if you get a one, check for the comments um, that I put in there. And if you get a zero, that means there's a big problem. Again, go look at the comments. I almost never give a, a, a zero on these. I, I almost always can help you, you know, narrow your focus or, or shift to something more appropriate. Um, I don't wanna say, no, you can't do that. I will give you some suggestions. Any questions on this? 
Okay. All right. When we wrapped up last time, we were talking about the various um, ways that you can contract HIV. And we were looking at the relative risk of different ways of getting HIV, as well as things that can reduce the risk. So obviously, a blood transfusion with HIV positive blood is the most risky. Receptive anal intercourse is second. Carry needles is third. And receptive penile vaginal would be fourth with rape being before consensual. And I think I misspelled consensual. I don't know why I can't spell when I type. I can't spell when I write on the whiteboard either. So that's kind of the, the ranking of this. It is possible to get HIV if you are the person inserting a penis into somebody else's body. It's not like that's a perfectly safe option. It's just lower risk than all of these other ones. So when we talk about how HIV works. This is the HIV molecule right here. So it's, it's diagrammed out for you. Inside there is RNA and there are some enzymes, most importantly an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And on the outside, there are these proteins sticking out. GP120 and GP41. We're going to use, we're going to talk about all of these concepts as we talk about what HIV does and how it gets into the cells. Nate, go ahead. Just real quick on that diagram, those proteins, is that kind of like the same concept for like COVID spike proteins or is it completely unrelated? Okay. Thanks. It's the same concept. Yes. Yes. And the spike proteins for COVID allow it to attach to and infect cells. GP120 allows HIV to attach to cells. And Do these two receptor or is it different? It's a different receptor. Thanks. So, text button. So, HIV binds to a specific receptor. You know, I'm going to do this on the whiteboard. I don't have enough room on here. HIV binds to a receptor on our white blood cells called CD4. White blood cells, of course, are part of the immune system. It uses GP120 to do this. I'm not gonna ask you GP120, I'm gonna, you know, I want more vague understanding of that from you guys, but I'm gonna use the specific terms when I talk about it. So GP120 binds to CD4. Now, there is also what we call a co-receptor on those white blood cells. So if, your white blood cells do not have this co-receptor. You cannot be infected. And there are two options. So it's either CCR5 
or CXCR4. Wow, these are really crazy names. Like I said, the concept that there is a sec, there are two receptors that have to be there is what I want you to know. Now, CD4 is one we're going to talk about a lot. Alexis, go ahead. So I, I don't know if this is going to like be like a stupid question, but you said if you don't have either of those correct, I don't know what that no was. receptors. You can't get HIV? Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. So there's some people who can't actually get it? Yes, yes. Hmm. A small percentage of the population is immune to HIV because they lack CCR5 and CXCR4, those co-receptors. That was clever of you to figure that out that fast. Um, now, lacking those co-receptors makes people more likely to get certain other diseases. So those are more likely to get things like West Nile virus and some tick-borne um, neurological diseases. Would Lyme disease be one of those? I haven't heard Lyme mentioned specifically, um, but it's possible. I, I would have to do research to look, look into that one specifically. If it's known, this is a rare, a, a relatively rare mutation. To, to lack these two co-receptors. Okay, so after binding, the virus membrane, the virus is wrapped in a membrane just like your cells have a membrane. And that membrane fuses with the CD4 positive white blood cell membrane. And then it inserts the viral RNA and some enzymes, some proteins into the host cell. All right, so I want you guys to, if you're doing screenshots, take a screenshot, because we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint for a second. I have another question. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it's related to HIV, but it's off topic of this. So like, you know how like needles will wash up at beaches and like sands and stuff, like in the sand? If you were to step on one of those, would HIV even be on it anymore or would there be any diseases? Not HIV. Um, other diseases, probably not. I think it would be very unlikely, okay. um, especially if it had been in the water for a long period of time. But yeah, um, when we talk about sharing needles, it's pretty much multiple people sitting around shooting up drugs at the same time, sharing the needles. Tetanus is a possibility. So you do, if you do step on a, a needle, you, you want to make sure you're up to date on your tetanus shot. But tetanus wouldn't be coming from the needle. It comes from the, the soil or the sand that's on the needle. And let me tell you, you do not want to get tetanus. So if you step on any piece of metal, 
make sure your tetanus shots are up to date. Call your doctor if you can't remember. Um, tetanus is, is really, really a nasty, nasty disease. I think it affects like the muscles, right? Like it causes them to be rigid and it's hard joints. Yeah. Yeah. It causes uncontrolled muscle contractions to the point where you can break bones. Um, and the muscle contractions can also make it so you can't open your mouth. It's called lock. It used to be called lock jaw. So you're definitely going to need medical treatment if you get tetanus. So let's go back and look at this image. So here is one virus particle. The virus particle is called virion or virion. So I'm, I'm so used to saying virion that you guys are just going to have to learn that word. All right. So attaches to the CD4 receptor, binds to the co-receptor. We don't really need to know what chemokine co-receptor means. That's not important for us. Then the membrane fuses fuses, the membrane of the virus fuses with the membrane of the cell and the proteins and the RNA go into the cell. One of those proteins is called reverse transcriptase. So when we talk about cells, oops, Nate, go ahead. That, uh, sorry for the abundance of questions. Um, that reverse transcriptase, you said that's an enzyme, right? Yes. I don't know if this is a, like a common suffix, but I've noticed a lot of enzymes end in ACE, like lactase. Is that how they name enzymes? Yes, exactly. Thanks. If it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme. So reverse transcriptase, or RT, converts the viral RNA to DNA. So in your cells, your cells do transcription where they copy information from your DNA into RNA as part of the process of making proteins. Reverse transcriptase takes that RNA from HIV and makes it into DNA. RNA goes to DNA. Then there is integration. That DNA is inserted into the host cell genes. So this is why once a cell is infected with HIV, it is permanently infected because the virus genetic information is now in that cell's genetic information. And then the virus uses the host cell, um, I'm going to call it machinery, to make proteins, lipids, and copies of viral RNA. which then assemble into new variants. Now these white blood cells, one of, one of the characteristics of these white blood cells is that they will replicate when there's an infection. They'll make more copies of themselves. And guess what? The new copies have the viral genetic information in those cells. So they're making new cells, which can make new viruses.
And these produce billions of virions per day from each infected cell. All right, I need some more room to type. So take a screenshot so I can erase these words. Uh, just on the diagram, like those green little like pea pod things, mm -hmm. you said those are ribosomes that are attaching to them, or I, for, I forget what you said. I just wanted to These write guys it. right here? Yes, ma'am. That's the um, CD4 receptor. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So, we call HIV a retrovirus. Retrovirus are viruses that use RNA that is converted to DNA when the virus infects a cell. Retroviruses often insert their genetic information into the host. With HIV in particular, that production of billions of virions from each cell means this virus has a high replication rate. It makes lots of virions very quickly. That's all high replication rate means. This means it can have a high error, error rate in producing new viral RNA. It can make a lot of mistakes. Lots of mistakes is called a high mutation rate. And a high, mu <clears throat> a high mutation rate means that the virus can develop drug resistance quickly. Hey, go ahead. Uh, in terms of like high mutation rate, lots of mistakes, is that kind of like, I know they're unrelated, but is that kind of like how cancer works? Like cells that become corrupted start multiplying out of control? It's related to that, yes. Yeah. When cells um, get enough mutations to become cancerous, their mutation rate goes up because they're dividing so fast. And of and course that- sorry, No, no, go ahead, I'll comment after. That makes them more likely to spread. It makes them um, have the potential to become resistant to chemotherapy. Yeah, go ahead, Nate. And that you said that Oh, I forget if it was a uh, genome genomic sequence, but you said it was the P53 that keeps cell corruption in control somewhat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And mutations in P53 make it more likely that you're going to get cancer. Absolutely. When did I talk about P53? <laughs> okay. So one of the things that we've started doing when we treat HIV are what are called multi-drug cocktails. Multi-drug 
which means we're giving patients multiple drugs at the same time, which make it harder for drug resistance to develop. And we've got drugs that work at lots of different places in the HIV infection process. So we have drugs that inhibit the ability of the virus to fuse with the cell membrane. And we have drugs that inhibit the ability of the virus to connect to the co-receptor. We have drugs that inhibit reverse transcriptase. We have drugs that inhibit the ability of the DNA, the, the genome, I'm sorry, the viral DNA to get integrated into your DNA. And we've got inhibitors that prevent the viral RNA and the viral proteins from coming together to form a virus. So we can inhibit all of these different steps. And when we use a multi-drug cocktail, we're trying to inhibit different steps. Because if you just use fusion inhibitors, you're more likely that the virus will be able to do a mutation that allows it to get around those fusion inhibitors. But if you have a fusion inhibitor, a reverse, yeah, reverse transcriptase inhibitor, a virus formation inhibitor, it's much, much harder for the drug to become resistant to all of those. And once you get enough virus, HIV starts killing white blood cells faster than your body can make them. All right, so I know we got some serious science going on here and it's a little complicated. What kind of questions do you have for me? What do I need to go over again? That medication, the fusion inhibitors, that's completely unrelated from like pro post exposure prophylaxis or is that the medication you're talking about? Post exposure prophylaxis will be drugs that can inhibit all of these different steps or multiple different steps. When I worked on HIV, we developed a fusion inhibitor, the first fusion inhibitor. Um, and it is a, it's not a great drug. I mean, it, it's great at its job, but it has to be injected. So it's kind of one of those, it's a medication that is given to HIV patients after their virus has developed resistance to a lot of other drugs. Okay. And if you wanna feel like you accomplished something in life, man, I worked on a fusion inhibitor. I, I, I wasn't the researcher, I was just a lab technician, but even so, feels good to know that there's a drug that I worked on out there. Okay, I'm getting ready to clear the screen. Okay, so this is a complicated graph that talks about what's going on in your body during HIV infection. So on the left, we have CD4 positive white blood cell counts. So you can literally count these CD4 positive cells and figure out how what the concentration of the blood is. And so that's this line here. On the right, we have how much HIV is in your bloodstream, the concentration of HIV. And that's this line here. And on the bottom, we have time. And notice that the first 
part of the graph is in weeks and the second part of the graph is in years. So over here, you get, well, let's not say you, someone gets infected with HIV. Their virus load, the amount of virus in the system goes up and the white blood cell count goes down dramatically within a couple of weeks. We call this acute HIV syndrome. The virus is getting into places where it can hang out like your lymph nodes and you might have flu-like symptoms or just bad cold kind of symptoms, maybe a light fever. Most people, these symptoms are so mild that they, you wouldn't normally go to a doctor for them. But after about nine weeks, the virus goes into what's called a latent period, which means you don't have a lot of symptoms. It's not spreading rapidly. So your white blood cell numbers go back up a little bit, not to the high level that they were before infection. And the amount of virus goes down, but not to zero. And then gradually over years, the white blood cell count continues to decline. The virus concentration continues to increase. And then you reach a point where when your white blood cell count, oops, white blood cell count gets below a certain point, we call that AIDS. And you start having symptoms. You start having those opportunistic infections coming in taking advantage of the fact that your immune system is weakened and causing diseases that you normally would not see in a person of that age. And once that happens, once you've got the symptoms of AIDS, within a couple of years, your white blood cell count continues to fall. The virus concentration starts going up much more rapidly and eventually you die, generally from one of the opportunistic infections. And I went back to saying you again, I'm sorry. All right, so this latent period can last for seven years. So you can be infected for seven years and have no symptoms, which is one of the, one of the tricks HIV does that allows it to spread. Julia, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, do you want us to copy this chart? I want you to understand what's going on in the chart. Okay. If copying it works, I mean, certainly take a screenshot. Um, but if you written all the steps that I was telling you about, that's fine too. Nate, go ahead. Uh, just for the graph, I guess the latency period, I guess that stops once your white blood cell count hits a certain threshold. And, and is that when it really like kicks into overdrive? Yes, basically, okay. yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody else. Nope, okay. And let me make a couple of notes on here. So clinical latency can last seven years. Symptoms of AIDS can last three years. This is untreated. Now I'm gonna go to the whiteboard and I'm gonna write 
out a lot of what I've already said to you guys. So let's go to the whiteboard. So when we talk about HIV infections, we divide it into the, the three pretty obvious stages. Stage one, like symptoms. You have a large amount of virus in blood and are highly contagious. CD4 positive cells, those white blood cells, decline in number, followed by a small rise not back to normal. Testing may or may not be accurate during this time. And why, a lot of, yeah. But why is it not, why is it uh, inconsistent in the early stage? It has to do with it depends on the type of test. And I, I, I'm sure the testing is getting better and better, but um, a lot of the early tests would look at things like uh, antibodies to HIV. And it takes a while for your body to start producing any antibodies to HIV, especially because the cells that produce the antibodies are infected. Stage two is the latent period, also known as latency, latency or dormancy, which I misspelled. This is largely without symptoms, asymptomatic. Anytime you see a scientific or medical term that starts with A, that means without or not. So it literally without symptoms. CD4 count continues to decline slowly. The immune system is slowing viral growth but cannot stop it. And this can last seven years or more if untreated. If you get treatment with the treatment we have today, we don't know how long this can last. We know it can last for decades, but we don't know exactly how long because we've only had good drugs for decades. In fact, there's a lot of thought that some people who have been on these HIV drugs may be, um, may have cleared the virus completely. The amount of virus is so small that it's undetectable. But we keep them, we keep these people on drugs because, you know, you don't want to take them off of drugs and have the virus come roaring back. Stage three is AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. The CD4 positive count falls to a level where the immune system is not functioning appropriately, not functioning um, and cannot stop viral growth. Get a dramatic rise in virus count. 
We get those opportunistic infections. And this can last up to three years. And during this time, highly contagious again. Would we consider AIDS a death sentence with modern treatment? No. With modern treatment, we consider it a manageable illness. Now, that is not to say that everybody who gets HIV and treatment is going to survive long term. But a lot of people are. It's kind of like if you have diabetes, you can manage diabetes, but sometimes it still kills people. It can still become severe problem. And it's, it's the same thing with, with modern treatment for HIV. Does that clear that up, Nate? Okay, good. All right. So this is basically describing what was happening on that graph. So this is a good point to take a screenshot. And then we're gonna talk about um, drugs. Megan, go ahead. So I noticed that in stage one and stage three, it's highly contagious. Yes. Um, so on stage two, what kind of, I guess I'm trying to ask, what's like the percentage of um, like the lower risk, you know, between like stage one and stage three? Yes. If you were to, you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yes, I do know what you're trying to say. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> stage two is definitely lower risk of um, being contagious. There's not a specific number associated with that because it really depends on where you are in stage two as to how infectious you are, uh, but it is less than stage one or stage three. So I can't just put a number on it, sorry. Okay. So, treatments, the early treatments were, were really hard. It was really difficult to follow the treatment regime. And it was really, they really had a lot of nasty side effects. So you could take lots of different pills taken at different intervals, some with food, some without, some couldn't be taken at the same time. So you literally had to get this schedule. Your doctor would work with you to come up with a schedule for you to take your medications at. And so you might have to get up at the same time every day. Say you get up at seven o'clock, you take a pill before breakfast. After you eat breakfast, you take a different pill. Mid-morning, you take another pill that you can't take with any food. Then you take a pre-lunch pill and a post-lunch pill. And I mean, you're, you're getting the idea of, you know, all of these different times and, you know, lots and lots of different pills. It was also very expensive. And a lot of people literally could not afford the medication that they needed. So in the 90s, while there were drugs around, a lot of people were still dying of HIV because they 
couldn't afford their treatment. But today, we've got multi-drug pills. And this is a little outdated because we actually have treatments that are less than one pill a day. So you can get periodic injections or you can get medications that don't have to be taken daily. It's still expensive. But we think that people can have a normal or near normal life expectancy. Now you still get side effects. You can have liver damage. You can have nerve damage. You can have an increased risk of heart attacks. So it's still not an easy um, drug treatment. It's still not easy on the body. Patients can get to no detectable HIV. But remember how the virus genes were inserted into host cells? That means that if you you can, the virus can stay dormant in long lived white blood cells. I'm typing over other words. We have white blood cells that can live for decades. We call these memory cells. And it's very important, no drug vacations. So people will sometimes due to side effects or due to finances, not always take their drugs like their doctor wants them to. Um, and with HIV, that can cause uh, a breakthrough, which increases the likelihood of mutations and can, you know, send you into AIDS very, very quickly. All right. Screenshot time. I don't know why I do this when I tell you to screenshot. <laughs> it's not like you guys have cameras, unless you're using your phone. All right. There are a small number of patients who appear to have been cured of HIV. One for sure, up to the last number I looked at said five, but four of those are still taking medications. Only one is not taking the HIV medications. What happened? In the early 2000s in Berlin, 
HIV positive patient got a bone marrow transplant. So, most of your blood cells, once you're an adult, are produced in the bone marrow. If you get blood cancers, a lot of times they will do a bone marrow transplant and they basically, this process kills the cells in your bone marrow. So it kills all the cells that produce blood cells and then they replace these cells with bone marrow cells from a healthy donor. It's not hard for the donor, but it's very hard for the recipient. And it does not have a 100% survival rate. I mean, if you imagine you're killing off a person's immune system, their ability to make red blood cells, their ability to clot. And you give them somebody else's bone marrow cells and you hope that those bone marrow cells take, that they don't cause immune, abnormal immune responses, that they function normally. It's really a bizarre process. That's called rejection, right? Like when you receive something and your body doesn't adhere to it. Yeah, rejection or what's called host versus uh, graft disease or graft versus host disease. That new immune system might attack your cells. So yeah, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong here. For this patient, the donor did not have the co-receptors. We talked about that mutation that makes you immune to HIV. The donor for this one patient did not have those co-receptors. The patient went off HIV drugs in 2006 and st is still alive with no detectable virus. Great, there is a cure, <laughs> but there's always a but. Bone marrow transplants are difficult for the recipient and they're risky. And Uh, the negative for those co-receptors is rare. Add that to finding a good bone marrow match being really hard. And you've got, obviously, it's one of those things that it would be nice if we could do this for everybody with HIV, but you know, it's a, you know, one in a billion chance that you would find somebody who could donate their bone marrow to you and cure you of AIDS. Questions on any of this part? Bone marrow transplants, aren't they very painful? For the donor or the recipient? Whoever. Okay. Both. Donating bone marrow, there are two ways you can donate bone marrow. One of which you take some medication 
and then you basically they take a blood sample they they it's like giving donating blood okay that one you might not you might feel a little ill while on the medication but i think that's a short term like a week or a couple of days before you give blood and so that's not any worse than giving blood if they take it straight from your bone marrow from your bones that process is painful um, however it's an outpatient procedure and generally you can go back to work the next day and deal with it with like advil and stuff you don't need any heavy drugs it's not that painful why couldn't they just sedate you when they extract the bone marrow <clears throat> They probably, they, they do these days, they do give you treatments so that you don't feel it when they're doing that. I don't know if they, um, I don't know if they sedate you. They probably lightly sedate you and give you like a, a spinal nice. block, like what they do for women in labor. I haven't donated marrow, so I don't know. I do know somebody who had a type of blood cancer and received a bone marrow transplant. And that's been, oh, good grief. It's been over a decade since he received that bone marrow transplant. And it, you know, it saved his life. Which is great because he's got kids. <laughs> well, that's great anyway, but all right. That was a hard fucking year. Oh, excuse my language. I try not to cuss on Zoom. Sorry if you've got kids in the room. Okay, so we've talked about this. Prevention is the best. Condoms. Use them, people. It's not just HIV out there. There are a lot of things you can get with sex, and condoms prevent most of them. There is PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis or preventative. Prophylaxis is the medical term for preventative. PrEP isn't great. They, there can be lots of side effects. Of course, you know, it costs money. Um, you can have digestive problems. Weight loss, headaches. But it's still better than HIV. Post-exposure prophylaxis, also called highly active, oops, I forgot to put a slash in there. Anti-retroviral therapy. Fancy name. Heart. Abbreviated heart. This is a high dose. HIV medications that may be able to stop the disease before it gets established. So you use heart if you've been potentially exposed in a medical setting or you think you got exposed through a sexual encounter and you need that preventative, that's what those are for. And with heart, the sooner the better. All right, so that's a lot of the science right there. So yep. Screenshot time if you haven't done it yet.
So going back to the history, 1987, this is what we call the turning point. Remember, this is the era of Ryan White. This is the era when we start seeing a lot of hemophiliacs and blood transfusion recipients. Getting HIV. This is also the point where even though AIDS was strongly associated with gay men and IV drug users, but heterosexual transmission started to surpass homosexual transmission. And this happened first in the African-American community. Another marginalized group, right? 1987 was also the year, the first time a US president, it was Reagan, mentioned AIDS in public. He started caving to pressure and he had the Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett Coop prepare a report on HIV AIDS. And he intended this report to be used by the government. Coop decided that clear, explicit, and non-judgmental information was the most powerful weapon against the AIDS pandemic. And so instead of just preparing a report for the government, he wrote this uh, brochure and mailed it to all U.S. households in 1988, which apparently he didn't tell Reagan he was doing, and Reagan didn't know about this till he got a copy in the mail. So, Reagan was not happy. This document that was sent to all houses in the US did mention anal intercourse increasing risk, and it mentioned using condoms to reduce risk. And so Coop ended up being silenced by the administration. The government did not want to be seen as accepting of sodomy and condom use or even sex outside of marriage. The government then produced material to kind of try and supplant what Coop sent out that had that vague terminology about exchanging bodily fluids and intimate sexual activity instead of just saying sex. And so of course, this led to the misunderstanding that things like kissing or sharing drinks would lead to AIDS. Sodomy is not currently illegal anywhere in the US, um, but it was illegal in certain states up until the early 2000s. I think I, think I have that. Is it still illegal in like 30 some countries to this? Yes, day? yes, it is still illegal in other countries and people get the death penalty for it in a couple of countries. 
Yeah, I was reading about, there's a province in Indonesia, it's called Aceh. Um, it's like a heavily religious province of Indonesia. And uh, I was reading an article a year ago where these two guys, I don't know how they got caught. I think they had like government officials like go in and like burst into the room and they got like caned to death. It was just awful. So. Yes. So here it is in my, my notes. Sodomy became legal in the US in 2003. There was a Supreme Court case against the state of Texas. Not surprisingly, Texas was still having it outlawed. Um, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't outlaw sodomy or anal sex. Um, worldwide, I thought I had the number written down. I don't see the number in my notes really quick. But yes, there are still countries where it is illegal and there are still countries where people are put to death. Okay, so. I agree with Coop that the best way to deal with HIV is education. During the 80s in particular, AIDS education and sex education were, were really crappy. In fact, a lot of places in the US, they're still pretty crappy. Um, the idea that this disease is spread by so-called immoral actions means schools, doctors, and government officials are not going to talk about it openly. And, even today, a lot of people are not comfortable talking frankly about these sorts of conditions. Julia, go ahead. Didn't Florida just pass a ban? Like, like, yeah, I know, I'm disgusted with it too. Didn't they just pass a ban where like you can't talk about it in school or something like that? I know they passed a ban on talking about critical race theory. I heard it was against the LGBTQ plus community, that's why. Oh, it might be. They might have done that as well. Okay. Florida's really. Yeah, it's messed up there. Yeah. I mean, it's a state that's well known for crazy people. <laughs> I was born there. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it hasn't been known as a conservative stronghold until recently, but yeah, I, I suspect it's also an issue in Texas. Yeah, probably. Yeah. When I teach general biology, I always have, I always give lectures on sex ed and there's always at least a couple of students who did not learn it in school or learned things that are flat out wrong in school. Can you give me an example? I couldn't imagine how you can learn something so, you know, wrong about something so uh, one way rather. A lot of it is, um, Pregnancy prevention. Okay. So a lot of that information is not given out. Um, the stuff we've been talking about, about how anal sex is a higher risk for transmitting sexually transmitted infections and anything about abortion. <laughs> so Say anything about abortion. <laughs> pretty much anything about abortion. Yeah. I mean, people get taught that birth control pills cause an abortion. They don't. They get taught that um, post-sex preventative, those second chance plan B drugs cause abortions. They don't. They think that abortions are a lot more common than they are. And they think that they're mostly by women who just don't want to have a baby. Um, whereas a lot of abortions in the US 
Yeah, are it's about more than that. Oh my God. That, that, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, not a problem. It's a controversial topic. It's just like, in my opinion, it shouldn't be controversial. No. Like what, I mean, honestly, like Planned Parenthood, I think like 3% of their, they perform like 3% abortions. That's their service. And then the rest is just like providing like condoms and birth control, which doesn't harm babies. It Most people take it for like a menstrual, like there's menstrual cycle. Yep. And like condoms, it's free mammograms, it's free STD testings and stuff like that. And that's the problem because just this country just fails to educate people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just so mad. Like this shouldn't be an argument. And there's a significantly, well, not a significant size, but a very loud group that basically doesn't want women to have control over reproduction. Yeah. And I don't like, and it's like white, it's like white old men mm-hmm. like making laws for me. Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. You will never have to have a baby. Like you'll never have to deal with this. Like, I don't know. It's just hypocritical. Like I bet if one of their daughters got pregnant, like a teenager, you know what they do. Like, oh, you know, it's absolutely. Just, it gets yeah. me so mad. This country. <laughs> yes. Yes. It, it, it's a huge thing. Um, we've only got two minutes. So I'm going to tell you a story and then we'll call it a day. A very good friend of mine was pregnant with a baby she wanted. And at the end of the second trimester, she went in and got an ultrasound and they discovered it was a boy and they went out and started buying boy clothes and they came, they announced the name that they wanted to name it. And it was all a big deal. And the next day, the doctor called her and said, I've reviewed the sonogram. This baby is not viable. He didn't have lungs. He had a a very rare genetic mutation that is 100% fatal within at the most a couple of days of birth. And she was told that her baby would die immediately as soon as the umbilical cord was cut because he doesn't have lungs. He can't get in oxygen. And she had to have an end second trimester abortion. And she had to make this decision very, very quickly. She didn't have time to sit with it and feel it and deal with the emotions because if she waited a week, she would be in her third trimester. And third trimester abortion, even though she lived in California, she would have had to drive hundreds of miles, stay in a hotel room in a strange town because people fight this. It was just incredibly traumatic. And it's the story I tell every time we talk, I talk about abortion, because if you, if you think abortion is about killing babies, you're so wrong. So, whew, not a happy note to end on, but we're at the end of our lecture. Anything else anybody wants to say? I have something that's a little funny regarding sex ed. My sister says that her health teacher in high school told them that the female orgasm was a myth. But- <laughs> Can I add a joke to that, please? Absolutely. Maybe it, was, it was a myth in his life because he never got it to that point. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Female orgasms are real, guys. Absolutely. So, yeah. Sex ed is not always very good. Any other That's a better note to end on. Anything else you guys want to talk about? All right. Then 